Welcome to South Asia Chat, a podcast brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. I'm your host Ramita Iyer, research analyst at the institute. In June 2023, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi made an official state visit to Washington, marking the third official to be hosted by US President Joe Biden since taking office. The visit has been hailed as a demonstration of both sides intention to take their bilateral cooperation to the next level while there have been significant developments over the past few years a number of challenges do remain for this episode i'm pleased to be joined by dr yogesh joshi research fellow at isas we will be examining modi's visit to washington and its implications on india us relations yogesh welcome to the podcast thanks ramita glad to be here So one of the key outcomes of Modi's visit has been the Biden administration's commitment to enhancing uh, India's defense capabilities. The joint statement that was released mentioned the transfer of technology from the US to India to indigenously produce jet engines. For nearly two decades now, we've seen that India and the US have steadily expanded their uh, defense cooperation, but all engagement has taken place with a, a certain sense of caution. Given this, how important is the recent announcement for India, and do you see it as a turning point in bilateral defense ties? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, and so far, once one can understand that this is the first time US is providing such critical technology uh, to to any of its partners, leave aside its allies. Uh, US has never parted ways with. uh jet engine technology for uh any of its allies too uh, so in, in that sense this is uh a milestone uh, or as many are saying a trail blazing event uh in the indo us defense partnership uh it also kind of underlines you know what india has always expected or always looked for which is the transfer of technology critical technology in the defense sector from the us and india has always maintained that that is in some sense the threshold which us has to cross uh, to cement uh, the indo us defense relationship now as you mentioned uh, india has been asking for jet engine technology since the 1980s uh, when the light combat aircraft project was first conceived uh, you know some of these technologies were discussed Uh, right in the second administration of uh, you know uh, indira gandhi in 1980s uh, when the first framework for science and technology cooperation was signed uh, but nothing really eventually happened uh, on that front for almost two decades india still choose for its uh, lca program the tejas mark 1 program uh, still choose the g four zero four engines which are a precursors to the g four one four engines uh, which are now being offered um, by the u s uh, but the earlier engines were just bought uh, wholesale from the u s but this time almost eighty percent of critical jet technology will be offered to india uh, right so you know <clears throat> india's own indigenous efforts have failed miserably Uh, even when putting in almost 3000 man hours on developing india's indigenous jet engine called the kaveri uh, and some of these technologies uh, you know if you can look at uh, you know uh, might appear to be uh, very simple uh, but they are extremely sensitive uh, and india hasn't been able to develop that so in that sense in so far that this is the first of the defense deals where there is almost a complete transfer of technology and that too in a critical sector such as jet engines uh, which will not only uh, power the next set uh, the next generation of the tejas or the light combat aircraft program called the tejas mark uh, second uh, fighter jets uh, but also uh, the advanced medium combat aircraft which is the fifth generation plus program india is com- uh, currently uh, currently embarked upon but also the twin in twin engine deck based fighters for the indian navy uh, so the so this whole enterprise with the ge uh, has a potential to revolutionize uh, you know india's capabilities uh, in fighter aircrafts 
uh, and not only uh, you know uh, not only empower India's air force as well as the navy, uh, especially uh, when it comes to uh, their fly their 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 flying capabilities, uh, but also may in the future as India intends to become a major exporter uh, of defense of defense products world over uh, may may catalyze also India's defense exports so this is this is in some sense you know these 30 years of India India US defense engagement uh, this is a critical output uh, of those three decades of defense engagement so the joint statement also highlighted the restructuring of technological supply chains in Asia, focusing on uh, greater engagement on techno-economic cooperation as part of uh, Washington's new strategy to de-risk from China. Uh, recently in March, during U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo's visit to Delhi, a memorandum of understanding was signed between both sides on semiconductor supply chains as well. What are your thoughts on these developments? So look, the whole idea of supply chain resilience and building an initiative between India and U.S. bilaterally, uh, but also India and U.S., as you very well know, uh, having worked in the IPF, that they are also looking at somehow de-risking uh, their economies uh, vis-a-vis their susceptibility to coercion and over-dependence on the Chinese economy. Right, and that has started happening way before uh, even the pandemic, um, because in some sense these countries do feel that their over-dependence on China provides Beijing a tool to beat them over and create susceptibilities, especially which becomes extreme vulnerabilities uh, in an era of intense geopolitical competition. Uh, so unlike the 1990s era of globalization where economic efficiency and this whole idea of, uh, you know, this whole liberal idea that interdependence will lead to uh, more peaceful relations have completely been undone. So states are looking are looking less at economic efficiencies, but more at economic security. Similarly, unlike the previous uh, idea that interdependence will lead to some kind of peaceful resolution of disputes. They now believe that interdependence or, in China's case, over-dependence on Chinese economy actually creates uh, far, uh, immense vulnerabilities. So, geopolitics literally is driving economics as of today, uh, right? Uh, and therefore, India and the U.S. are collaborating together to reduce those dependencies uh, on China. Uh, that includes uh, semiconductors, uh, you know, which are critical technologies, uh, but also on many other fronts, right? Pharmaceuticals, vaccines, for that matter. Uh, many other domains where uh, manufacturing, you know, simply manufacturing, simple trade between uh, uh, between nations, in a sense. Uh, so, but particularly on some of the critical products where. The economy is extremely dependent. Uh, so, that also provides India with a kind of a geoeconomic opportunity it hasn't had before. Uh, so, so, what is very interesting is that India's push uh, for greater economic activity to be placed in the Indian subcontinent is occurring in a pe- era of deglobalization. Uh, whereas when most of the supply chains shifted to China, that occurred in a period of globalization. So India is actually looking at this particular uh, geopolitical anxiety, of the era of geopolitical anxiety, uh, as a moment of geoeconomic opportunity. Uh, and that gels well with the anxiety uh, which the U.S. is facing, especially uh, with you know the rise of China, which was in some sense comforted. Uh, by U.S. assistance, both technologically, economically, investment-wise, uh, to China in the 1990s and 2000s. Uh, so, insofar, uh, both the geopolitics and the geoeconomics alliance together uh, in support of this 
remaking of global supply chains. Uh, India and US are going to collaborate. And semiconductors is an interesting case in that sense. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, they signed this MOU on semiconductor supply chains and innovation partnership. Uh, and in the joint statement, uh, there was almost an investment of $2.5 billion. Uh, Micron is investing heavily. The Intel deal is still pending. Uh, but what is also happening is the U.S. effort to create an ecosystem, right, by training Indian engineers. So if one looks at the the, the joint statement, uh, there's also U.S.-based firms who are going to train and create knowledge centers. And that is a fundamental development uh, because much of, you know, this is not just producing the chip. It is also developing the ecosystem under which such very complicated technologies, uh, you know, that whole set of ecosystem which can help generate uh, the knowledge uh, and uh, the human resources, uh, you know, which are fundamentally required uh, to propel uh, that shift in supply chains at some point in time because that is critical. So even if you want, you know, you just can't shift the factories. You need that human resource and that infrastructure uh, to kind of sustain that over a period of time. Uh, and I think it's both uh, India's opportunity but also U.S. vulnerability uh, that is driving this. Uh, and particularly, look, if, in, if, if, if U.S. has to combat China's rise, it necessarily has to combat China's rise as a technological power. And uh, semiconductors, semiconductor chips are still uh, China's HVs here. Uh, so U.S. is also capitalizing uh, on, uh, on its own uh, advantages. Uh, and insofar, the India-U.S. relationship right, remains on an even keel. Uh, and also because there's no fundamental conflict of interest, right, uh, between India and the U.S. Uh, and therefore, we will see more and more, uh, not only this these bilateral initiatives uh, on reconfiguring of supply chains, and India is doing a lot when it comes to uh, some other sectors, whether it is pharmaceutical vaccines, you know, clean energy for that matter, solar panels, uh, uh, you know, so the joint statement also underlines that an Indian firm is investing a lot in building uh, solar panel uh, factories uh, in the U.S. And given that India is relatively, there's an economic side of it as well, you know, India is relatively still economically a more attractive option given uh, the labor, uh, you know, the cost of labor and other things. And if uh, the infrastructure push, which the current, current government is, is taking in India, right? So if you can create those incentives, both for the businesses, create the right atmosphere. Uh, and given that you have this, uh, this geopolitical and geoeconomic opportunity, right? Backing at your doorsteps. I think that's the right kind of environment to assist this reconfiguration of supply chains. And that's what is happening at this point in time. So you mentioned the IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which was featured in another key uh, element from the visit, which is on um, the statements that came out on the commitment of both sides you know, to, to multilateralism. Um, so the IPEF is a uh, 14 uh, country group, uh, a US-led economic initiative. And there's also the Quad or the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue a Forum, which consists of uh, Australia, India, Japan and the US. Um, what is the progress of these groupings and what are the prospects of multilateralism in the coming months? So as you, you know, as you very well know, the IPEF again, uh, you know, started in May 2022, right? Uh, and this is, this is a more of a multilateral f framework of U.S. allies and partners. So the IPF itself says the U.S. allies and partners, right? Of 14 countries, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and the Indo-Pacific mostly. Uh, uh, again, the attempt here is what is happening today. We need to kind of understand why, uh, you know, first of all, uh, what that why is 
U.S. putting so much of an effort to create this Indo-Pacific economic framework, uh, which is largely that security partnerships, security alliances, will henceforth drive economic activity. It will not be vice versa. Especially during the period of globalization, it didn't really matter, uh, you know, whom you are trading with, who are your trade partners, where the economic activity is getting concentrated on. But what IPEF is a clear example of how security is now driving economy and this will be more and more so. Having said that, This is again not a usual conventional free trade agreement. There are four pillars to it. Uh, The trade pillar, the supply chain pillar, the clean economy pillar and the fair economy pillar. Now, really nobody knows what this would be in concrete terms. To me as an outside observer observer who looks at many of geoeconomics from a geopolitics angle, what I reckon is that What the U.S. is trying to do is to rally its allies and partners uh, in some sense to counter China's rise, but also also an effort that it doesn't really lead to a completely deglobalized world. So globalization within its security allies and partners, that's the way to go about, uh, you know, countering China's rise and de-risking uh, the U.S. economy and other economies from over-dependence in China. Now, we haven't seen a lot of, sign- and correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't seen a lot of development on the trade side. The most developed aspect of the IPF so far are the supply chains, uh, uh, you know, uh, supply chains bit of it. Uh, Where, you know, according to the last uh, statements I've seen, or even the Indo-US joint statement, uh, substantial conclusions have, uh, you know, have been reached. And on fair economy and clean economy, we are in an advanced stage of negotiations. So this, what what it appears to me is that US is within these four broad pillars of the IPF, you would see substantial agreement on some of the pillars where all states who you know in a sense that way which might not be so conflictual uh, and i guess where states have far more shared interest than they might have in trade right so even in india us case right even leave apart leave aside china uh, the trade has been a major issue for india uh, even with like minded countries right uh, so uh, and it is also a very sensitive domestic politics issue so some of so one of those pillars would really not i think would take substantial amount of effort to come to come you know to reach to some kind of conclusion uh, so at this stage what i think is this is an overall framework to kind of align people together uh, in what in how us think us thinks that glo- global economy should be realigned away from China and insofar that shared understanding can be agreed upon uh, within these 14 major economies spread across the Indo-Pacific and which dovetails into, uh, you know, U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy. So for a long period of time, the Indo-Pacific strategy didn't really have an economic component and that's what you know, all the states in the region have been complaining about, okay, fine, you want, it, you want us to kind of, you know, uh, uh, deal with or in some sense understand our, uh, understand better our own interests and insecurities vis-a-vis China. Uh, but these are not just territorial insecurities, right? These are not just uh, security insecurities, but we also are heavily dependent upon China for our economic well-being. And much of international politics is domestic politics, right? Uh, Many of the elites in Southeast Asia, particularly, or even in East Asia, whether in Korea or Japan, you know, are highly dependent upon the Chinese economy. So, in some sense, U.S., Washington, D.C. came to understand gradually that it has to give an economic alternative 
of uh, to all these countries who are so intertwined with the Chinese economy, uh, to all to help them also take upon China in terms of security issues they face with, because otherwise they would just bandwagon with China or at least not take up. Uh, you know issues they real which impinge on their national security, which was happening with Vietnam and Philippines for quite some time, right? So it's it's in my understanding it is an effort to bring together all these major critical economies and states in the Indo-Pacific uh, to kind of build a shared understanding of how you know uh, we can tackle uh, the rise of China without. Uh, you know, uh, imposing severe economic penalties on these countries. Uh, but this will take quite some time to arrive to, you know. So clean economy and fair economy, again, in some sense, obliquely targets the BRI, right? Without the BRI, we would not have been talking about uh, not so much clean economy, but fair economy, right? Clean economy, again, is linked to climate change. Uh, and you know the new technologies which are coming up so it's both incentives which uh us might offer uh as the harbinger of many of these new technologies which help us combat climate change but also increase efficiency uh within the economy or the economic transformation based upon new technologies we are looking at uh but also counter the narrative uh the the values uh which china has tried to kind of you know, uh, uh, propagate through its own political economic model. So I think it's it's a battle at all of those levels. Well, broadly looking at uh, India US ties, uh, some experts have, uh, you know, given the recent developments, highlighted a paradox in the strategic ties. Uh, due to India's close ties with Russia, ranging from reservations due to India's proximity to the Soviet Union during the Cold uh, Cold War years, to even uh, you know, the uh, Delhi's present-day dependence on Moscow in the defense sector. Uh, there are also concerns about Modi's autocratic tendencies that have been voiced every now and then. Uh, do you see this as a paradox, or is the China factor and Delhi and Washington's mutual interest in containing Beijing uh, in the Indo-Pacific region sufficient to significantly uh, you know, enhance their strategic cooperation? Uh, so there are a number of questions here. Let me take them one by one, right? Uh, so first, the Russia question, you know. So I think it's in some sense, it's a dead horse. It's more like expectations from the US uh, and especially among the commentariat, not so much within the government. And in so far, the tone and tenor of Indo-US relations, you know, kind of suggest and especially starting from uh, February 2022 when uh, Vladimir Putin actually went inside Ukraine, right? The tone of the US government has been very different from, you know, the analysts and uh, the commentariat in the US, so to say, or in Europe. There are two or three factors here. First of all, I think US understands that there's an asymmetry of interests of when we start comparing India's interest in Ukraine and American interests in India vis-a-vis China. So there's a fundamental asymmetry of interest there. So India is not as invested in Ukraine or would ever be as US would be invested in India vis-a-vis China. So there's a fundamental, you know, asymmetry of interests. And insofar that US interests in India vis-a-vis China would always overpower India's relations with Russia, it doesn't matter to Delhi what all, you know, people in Washington DC might be saying. Uh, so, on bra- coming to brass text, it's about China. So, the first thing first. The second thing is that geography matters, right? US is a global power. India is not. And insofar, coming together of China and Russia creates a block of Eurasian authoritarians, which then combined with similar countries from Iran to Pakistan to North Korea, uh, it basically creates a very difficult situation for India 
which is looking over the Himalayas at this huge continental landmass of Eurasia, which unlike any other ally, which are one removed from the real geography of Eurasia. So India's geography and therefore India's interest would always be very different compared to US interests in Ukraine vis-a-vis Russia and India's interest in keeping Russia to the extent it can autonomous from China. It might be and there are increasing indications that Russia might become or has become a junior partner. But the underlying emphasis uh, on India's approach to Russia has been that you need Russia to keep Asia multipolar. Right. So insofar, even when Russia can have, and also there is a, a significant, uh, you know, in some sense expectation or trust that Russia can never be tamed. So, insofar India's attempt is to create an autonomous Russia, uh, at least or to the extent it can slow down the process of Russia becoming a junior partner of China, it will try to do that. Because India's aim fundamentally is not a multipolar world, it is a multipolar Asia. Because the route to multipolar world comes from a multipolar Asia. If Asia is not multipolar, you know, then the dreams of a multipolar world are all, you know, uh, in a sense, what, you know, uh, are are dreams, literally. So, in so far that that geography and that expect, that ambition uh, of creating uh, or or at least having a multipolar Asia is concerned, Russia is critical for India. And then we can talk about the defense deals and all that, but that is much more transactional. Yes, there is a legacy issue and all of that, but it is not as if India cannot do without Russia. Uh, But also, why would India not take whatever it gets uh, from any country? If India stops buying Russian arms, uh, what will happen to Russian economy? Right. That also means that much of this technology, which is pretty good technology, right? It might not be as uh, as effective or as uh, you know trailblazing in terms of American uh, American technology, but it is also not that costly. But also that it, if it goes all to China and Russia becomes completely dependent on China, then many of the obstacles which China faces in terms of defense technology will be far removed. So so those are the the metrics on which India is making its calculation. But fundamentally, it's about symmetry of influence. In so far, they are both focused on China. I think the Indo-US relationship is not going to be harmed by uh, the trajectory of India-Russia relations. Uh, I don't think so. And we have the evidence for the last two two years, right? Almost uh, one and a half years or whatever it is, uh, that there hasn't been a lot of impact. In fact, if one goes by uh, the evidence of this this particular joint statement and Modi's uh, uh, Modi's visit to the US. In fact, you know, it has dawned upon the US to kind of, uh, you know, attract India much more than before. It hasn't shunned India for what it has done, uh, its statement on Russia and its, you know, kind of uh, neutrality on Ukraine. It has actually embraced India more. Uh, so in some sense, you know, it, it, it kind of it falsifies the whole narrative that, oh, the India-Russia relationship is going to derail the India-US relationship. I don't think so. Uh, so second, coming to, coming to the democracy element, right? So these are the two, two major, ops, in some sense, possible roadblocks, right? Or possible bumps uh, in this very smooth ride which we are thinking, uh, you know, the India-US relations are on now. Uh, so, one of the fears which many in uh, U.S. Uh, commentariat have argued is that an illiberal democracy like India, if we support an illiberal democracy like India, it might challenge us just like China did, right, tomorrow. So, there are two things here. First, that there is no guarantee in international politics that tomorrow 
a rising power will not challenge you. So you can't ask for a guarantee uh, in a sense. But second, that we need to understand that unlike China or Russia, India doesn't threaten any of the US interests in the Indo-Pacific, right? Uh, India is not threatening uh, any of the allies of the US. Uh, un, you know, so, so there is no real fundamental conflict of interest. So even when, you know, there might be friction down the line in the US relationship, it would be much more on the values and norms of international politics. And India's recognition is a great part, right? But which US has done over a period of time. So why has US supported India's rise in the system? It's not because of China alone. But it's also because unlike Russia and China, US and India have no fundamental conflict of interest. And US has already, uh, you know, already agreed to, in some sense, India's supremacy in the Indian Ocean. And there is nothing left beyond that. So if India is going to hegemonize, it's going to hegemonize in the Indian Ocean rather than anywhere else. Because there is, there is no space for any uh, any any uh, any hegemonizing effort on the on its continental borders, right? It's a very status quo power in that sense. And if that has already been agreed, then I don't see there is a lot of of there should be a lot of worry on how a illiberal democracy aided by America, um, you know, would use its rise to challenge the U.S. Right? Uh, so there is not much there. But also that, you know, ju just the fact that if India is an illiberal democracy today, and if it was a perfect democracy in the first 50 years of its independence, what was happening to the Indo-US relations then? So yeah, you know, to, to, to kind of use selective evidence is also a major issue. But fundamentally, international politics is driven by interests, right? Uh, mm, uh, India-US relations are here today not because they both are democracies, right? Because they share shared interests. And the democracy bit is a cherry, uh, it's, it's, it's icing on the cake, uh, but it's not the cake. The cake are the interests uh, which have brought these two countries together. Uh, and it is, it is in some sense fundamentally about China. Uh, what else they share is no fundamental conflict of interest. And that uh, is the base on which this relationship is founded. Uh, yes, one should not worry about, uh, you know, democratic trends in India. Uh, obviously, yes. But, you know, in a sense that you cannot expect external, you know, pressure on India uh, to lead to some kind of internal change. Right. India in that sense is a vibrant democracy. Uh, you know, you, one may call it electoral democracy, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, that's the iron test of uh, democratic accountability. Uh, uh, so, and India in some sense has always been a liberal democracy. Uh, so, you know, in a sense that it, the whole argument just then, uh, you know, is based upon semantics. Uh, and semantics really doesn't allow you uh, to do a lot of analysis here, uh, you know. Um, so, so you know, and I don't want to get into the argument that uh, that U.S. had had strategic relationship with non-democracies and all that, because that's not the point. The point is that you don't have a fundamental conflict of interest, uh, not even in the foreseeable future, uh, and you share very robust interests. Uh, at this point in time, not only in terms of uh, the security dynamics, but uh, also economically, um, uh, as well as, uh, you know, how you want to shape the international system, uh, right? And I also think that the Indians acknowledge that India's rise would not have happened without in the U.S. and could not have, could not happen without persistent 
support from the U.S. Uh, and that is something which which the Indian decision makers very well know. Uh, so I don't think that yes, you know, India should, you know, democracy should be made ro- made more robust. Yes, but it, but that is much more an internal process, and uh, I don't think uh, that Indo-US relations would have any impact on how uh, you know the democratic systems kind of you know uh, unravel themselves in india or democratic processes influence but also that is not something which drives this relationship uh thanks for sharing your insights yogesh uh, you were listening to south asia chat to learn more about our work visit us at isas.nus.edu.sg you can also get updates on social media we are on twitter linkedin facebook and instagram